So hello, a warm welcome to you. Um, my name is Dr. Esther Schmidt. I'm the director of the Center for Historic Houses of India. Um, it's a um, relatively new organization, three years old. We are a national expert heritage body, and we are an organization to um, an umbrella organization really for the privately owned historic houses of India. So this um, lecture is uh, particularly exciting because it's part of a new experiment that we're conducting this year. It's a research project on particular rooms and room typologies in Indian palaces and forts. And it's very, very strange that you find a number of books dedicated to the architecture of historic houses or specific palaces or um, architectural typologies, but there's really not one single com comprehensive book on the interiors. And I thought one way of um, dealing with this is looking at the room typologies and the terms relating to specific rooms and whatever was happening in these rooms and how these rooms were used. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to welcome Professor Bautzer, who is also a um, board member at the Center for Historic Houses. He's been giving a number of brilliant lectures that you can find on our YouTube channel, Center for Historic Houses of India. and. Um, um, he is one of the leading scholars in the field of Indian art, with a particular focus on Rajasthan, Kota, and um, Bundi. So I'd like to, sorry. So I'd like to hand it over to you, um, Joachim. Thank you very much for joining again and so generously um, giving us your time. Well, thank you, Professor Schnick, for this kind introduction. Um, good evening or good afternoon. The Darbar in Rajasthan, or as it formerly was called Rajputana then and now, starts with a photograph which is signed by the photographers Shepard, uh, Charles Shepard and Arthur Robertson. And um, it shows many things which you will see again and again in, in course of this presentation. Number one is this part is the center of the so-called Darbar. This is the Raj study or stone. Then the insignia in the shape of two more charts and two chauris or chanvars. And there are two people which appear every now and then, this one and this one, the so-called Chokdaras occasionally translated as gatekeepers. The back of this unmounted photograph says the Maharaja of Bharatpur in Durbar, and in fact, the boy, if we go back shortly, is um, Maharaja Sri Rajendra Sabaisur Jasvan Singh Ji Bahadur Jang Maharaja of Jodhpur, who is about 11 years old. He succeeded to the Gadi or this part of the picture, the throne on 8th July, 1853, and he died there also in Deek in 1893. So Maharaja, when you hear this, you think about Maharajas, of course, the kings, but um, there are different um, kings, as we shall say. Here you see a translation of the word Darbar, um, which is translated in various Indian dictionaries as royal court, which is correct, or a king. Uh, below you see in a Angrezi um, Hindi chapter coach, I mean in an English uh, Hindi dictionary, the word Darbar and its pronunciation, Darbar, so no longer the normal pronunciation, Darbar. So in the English language, this is called Durbar, but it means the same. The court of any former Indian prince, as we shall see not only of former Indian princes, and most important, the ceremonial gathering of such a court. The colonial Darbars, those from 1877, 1903, and 1911, are not mentioned in these Indian dictionaries, which I consulted. Here we have an inscription saying, 
Maharaj Sri Godan, Godadan Lal Ji Natuara. So you may think that this is a secular Maharaja because he is addressed as Maharaj, but as we shall see, it is not. It is a portrait, a photograph by the famous Mohanlal of Meva Udaipur. Um, here is the inscription we saw before. And it says, Gordon Lalji from Natwara. This gentleman, Tilkayat Govardhanji, was the head priest of the Haveli or temple of Srinachi in his at his home of Srinachi, Natwara in Rajasthan. I show this photograph to compare it with this photograph, which shows to our right, Maharaja Di Raja Maharaja Sri Jasvan Singh Ji, second Sahib Bahadur Maharaja of Jodhpur, the gentleman to your right, who ruled from 1873 to 1895. As you can see, the position, the sword, the jewelry, the chair and the table, all this is almost identical. But this gentleman here, he is the secular real Maharaja, and he is, so to say, the religious Maharaja. Um, now about the word Darbal, as it is explained. Um, below to our right, you have an enlargement of the inscription here on top, which is Shri Darbal, Dojan Salji, and etc., Rajnath, uh, Dekri, and etc. This means Sri Darbar replaces actually the title of this ruler who is Maharao Dojan Salji of Kota. Sri Darbar so stands for his long title, which would be um, Dojan Salji, Bahadur, etc., etc. And uh, as you can see here, he watches a nach, a dance performance um without being in what is would be called a formal darba or derba the same ruler was painted numerous times in a palace called arjun mahal within the garden of kota and we will see an enlargement of the wall painting below which says again shri darba it does not mention the titles of the ruler, it just says the king, Shri Dabal, Dojan Salji, Bahadur, Savari, Chogan Ki Rang Bariko. That means he is near Rang Bari, where there is a famous temple which is visited by the Maharaj of Kota during the Daseda holidays. And on the Chogan, that means the last large field, it doesn't necessarily mean that people were really playing polo on this field. Chogan means polo. He is spearing as part of the annual Dashara uh, celebrations a buffalo. Um, another instance where we have the word Darbara, just meaning king, without mentioning the titles of the king, is this one. We see Maharao Umit Singhji facing his chief minister. Zalim Singhji. The inscription says Shri Daba Umit Singhji Murade Zalim Singhji. This year just means G. Zalim Singhji was one of the chief minister for many years. He was the regent of the Kota State. More interesting is this picture. Uh, all the photographs are the photographs of paintings which were painted at Kota. So this says again, Sri Dabar Ram Singh Ji Bahadur or Rabal Jai Salmeya. That means that Maharao Raja, etc., etc. Ram Singh Ji, this is this gentleman, meets the Maharaval of Jai Salmeya. This is this gentleman, and he was Maharaja uh, Gat Singh. And he meets them. Maybe we can see this because they have some negotiations about a bride that. Maharao Ram Singh is going to marry from the clan of the Jaisalmer ruler. The interesting thing is that this inscription may be misleading because it is 
not only a king as Sri Darbar, it is a Darbar as we understand it, not always correctly, as we understand it um, now. This is a Darbar with the people I already mentioned, a Chopdar and the bearer of insignias, Morchal and Chauris or Chanwas. Um, this Darbar we have seen before, or in Kota, we should say Dari Khana, why we say so, uh, will become clear when we see the next slides. Here you see a photograph taken by Eugene Klatterbach Impe prior to 1865, and it shows to your right here a large tent. And in front of the tent is an enclosure. This is a space where the Darba may take place or has taken place. And here are numerous smaller tents where the army um, has their camp. When we go back, you will see here that this is um, the large tent and this is a space before the large tent where the Darbas can take place. This is this one here. So in those days, to say it from the very beginning, there was no place which was really used for that Darbas in the sense that we understand it today. Another word just mentioned is this one, which is called Dari Khane. This is the actual word which would be translated, so to say, as Darbal. It says Shri Dari Khani Maharaji, Shri Ram Singhji, uh, Samat Unis, uh, so it, So it's, it's a dated wall painting in the Bada Mahal and um, 85, let me see what is the uh, date in our, uh, 1829, it's dated 1829, and it shows in Darbar actually Maharao Ram Singh with the son of the tutela uh, of the regent, uh, Madhu Singh. He is identified here on the sheath of his sword. Um, going back to um, other gentlemen, here we have um, Chatwushal, who ruled 1758 to 1764. It is this gentleman, how oh, it's even dated here. And here we have the word again, Darihana or Darihano, which is the assembly of the state as we see it here on the occasion of the Janmashtami, which we recently celebrated. It says here, Patra Jan Mashtami Ka Samai Ko Raj Mahal Ko Darihani. That means the Darba takes place in the royal palace, the Raj Mahal. And it's even dated somewhat on the sword pixies. Um, but uh, we will not care about this. Here you see Maharaja Patusar, and here the region Jala Zalem Singhji. And here we then tutela deity of the Kota state, Sri Brajnachi with his Swamini exposed in the um, Raj Mahal. Normally he is in his own temple. Um, going back to further rulers, we have here Dojan Salji again, who ruled from 1723 to 1756. The same thing. But here we don't have the title Sri Daba, we have this full title. Maharaji Diraja Maharaji Sri Dojan Salji, and then Darihanu Raj Mahal, Darihanu Che Raj Mahal Ko. Ah, here's the inscription, uh, better readable for you. Um, that means also here, the Daruba, I think it is held because of this Salga or birthday. Um, in the Raj Mahal. What I want to point out is the fact that this is actually one of the oldest buildings of the Kota Gar, just towering the Raj Mahal. And we shall see it is a kind of carbon copy of the Badal Mahal of Bundi, which I had presented during an earlier occasion. Now, going back in time to the year 1720 to 1723, 
This is Maharao Arjun Singh Ji. And here again, we have the full titles. Uh, Maharao Ji Shri Arjun Singh Ji Janmashtami Ko Dari Khano Raj Mahal Ko. So again, this is a darbar in the Raj Mahal, which is here. And this is the oldest part of the, this part of the palace, um, which we see also later from inside. Now, what means study? What means study Hana? Dari is translated in some dictionaries. This is, here's the word Dari as cave, cavern. Um, but for us, it is important that we say carpet. But Dari Khana, house with several doors and windows in it, uh, uh, doesn't uh, make sense. That is not automatically the Daba Hall. And Dari Khani, here it is, uh, sorry, Dari Khana, see uh, Baradari, that Baradari means actually a house with 12 openings, Bara, 12. Um, but a summer house with several indoors. So here the dictionary is not of much help. Um, here we see late His Highness Maharao Bridgewat Singhji, who unfortunately passed away later this year, uh, in front of one of the greatest unfinished quota drawings, of which we will see a small detail here, um, only the right half. And the painting illustrates a famous battle fought by Maharao Chatrushal in 1761, the Battle of Bhatwara. But this is the evening before the Battle of Bhatwara. And uh, sorry, um, I should show you this. This is the center of this composition. And the inscription, which is there on top, is reproduced here again, and she, it says Dari Khana Ko Deri. That means this is the Darbar of the camp, meant the military camp. Going back to Dojan Sal, because there are so many of his wall paintings in the Arjun Mahal, instead of saying Shri Darbar, it said Shri Shri Maharaja Di Raja Shri Maharao Ji Shri Dojan Sal Ji which could be abbreviated by the word Darbar. And then we have the word Darikhano Salgarko. I hope you can read the Darikhano Salgarko. That means a Darbar held on the occasion of his anniversary. And here we have so many ingredients to a Darbar like the Chopda and what was typical for a Kota, this was the wrestling. This was the, this were the jetis and also the dance, and we see here the orchestra playing. Interesting is, of course, that only the people who um, are here allowed on this type of kilted carpet, um, they may sit here, only those musicians which have more or less to sit, they were allowed to do that. Another word which we have, Oh, why do I see the strange bar? Um, it's a word, Divan Khana. This is a painting in the Kota collection, which shows the meeting of the Maharaja of Jaipur and the Mahara Maharaja of um, Jodhpur, as is said here in the description, in, in description, but I can't see everything, um, a meeting we love. And it says, Darbar Divan Khane. That means a Darbar in the house of the Divan. And divan khane, this is a term which we may use for old places where a darbar was held. Here you see divan has uh, different meanings, but here below divan khana means hall of audience. And in our respect, this is a correct name. The most interesting thing in the Madhu Singh Museum of Kota is this large naksha or chart. It is the seating chart of the formal darbar or dari khana in the Raj Mahal, in the royal palace. I will only show you this detail. We will have no time to talk all about these people, which show you how in the olden days, how and where people were seated, especially where you cannot just 
enter the, the, the Dadi Khana Hall and take a seat wherever you want. Um, this has to do with your social rank. Here again, in large seating chart from the Darbar or Dadi Khana in the Raj Mahal. In the center is the Raj Gadi. See here, Gadi, this word is, means throne, is written with double D, with two D, and in English is mostly written only with one D. And two is seated there. This is Sri Ji Huzur Maharao Sahib Bahadur. That means the Maharao of Kota. He sits in the center. And he is not alone. He is people standing um, behind him. This is the Rajgadi, you know, sheltered by a Chamyana, although the sun wouldn't shine inside. This is part of the Raj Mahal, of the Raj Mahal as we see it today. And it's so interesting because it has a full genealogy of the Maharaos of Kota, which I had published some 30 or 35 years ago. This is the Raj Mahal, um, as I remember it. And below there, there's a, a type of grill to protect the wall paintings from uh, uh, the, the pigeons. And I will show you how exactly this place looked like on the 10th February this year. This is Maharao. Oh, we don't see him, but just to show you, this is Viraj Mahal within the Gar of Kota. What you see here that only men, practically only males are present. They are all seated on this uh, type of uh, kilted uh, carpets. And because the woman, they are seated behind this, um, there is still this separation. And now this paint, this photograph may surprise you because uh, what has this to do with the Darabas? Well, as you shall see a lot, um, um, is, is the next uh, photograph actually shown? I see in the background, it shows the other one. Um, you should see this photograph, which shows Yaks, yes, exactly. The Yaks at the um, Sikkim Tibetan border at a place called Tsongu. And you can hire these animals for a ride. You see, there is a dart where you can see what is their rate. These animals are starch black. They are completely black. Whereas for the insignia, their tail is used, but the tail is only used from the white yak. Here you see the insignia um, as they are on display in the Kota Museum. This is a Chanwa, also called Chauri in Hindi. Um, this is a white tail of a uh, yak with a handle. This is a Morchal, the second from right. I don't know if you can see my pointer. Uh, Mor is the peacock and it has small peacock feathers on it. Then comes the dal or shield, as you can see here, as part of the silikane and the um, it's um, the silikane near the Mubarak Mahal within the palace of uh, Jaipur, and the talwar or sword. By the way, the one with the straight blade. This is the sword of Emperor Jahangir, and then again. A Morchal, the one to the right is from the museum in the uh, Miranga Fort, and again the Chanwa or Chauri. And exactly these insignia, which reappear in many, many depictions of Darbars, were on display on this very day, the 10th of February 2022. You have here present His Highness Maharaji Sri. Ijaraj Singhji, Maharaj Kumar, his son, Maharaj Kumar Jayadev Singhji. And here you have the Chanwa, the Morchal, 
the shield, dal, the talva or sword, again, the chauri or chanwal, and then the morchal. So exactly the same insignia, the same objects as were mentioned in this chart of the Madhusing Museum in the Gar of Kota. Why are Kota and Bundi so fascinating and interesting? This is because they very early appeared in Mughal painting um, identified. This is the approach to the fortress of Rantambor. Rantambor is no longer part of the Bundi or Kota state or of the former Bundi and Kota state. Uh, today it's lying in the uh, Jaipur state um, in the Sabai Madhupur district. And you see how high up are the walls of this fortress, which was besieged by Emperor Akbar in February 1568. To your left, you see a painting, and this is, of course, from the famous Akbar Name and the Victoria and Albert Museum, London. You see on the left part here these smaller cannons trying to shoot their balls up to cannon balls to the fortress, but they fail. So Akbar ordered a ramp to be constructed, which was very difficult and probably took a large toll of lives in order to bring heavier cannons on a higher height, on a higher platform. And these cannons shelled the fortress of Rantambor, which as a consequence started burning. This was achieved by heating the cannonballs before they were shot. And um, the result is that the commander of this fortress, who was the Bundi ruler, Rao Sojan Singh Hara, who reigned from 1554 to 1585, had to submit, had to surrender the fort of Rantambor to the Mughal ruler Akbar, who, as you know, ruled from 1556 to 1605. This is the scene here. Akbar sits on a throne that we will have no time to work on this more. And here you see somebody is there behind who takes care that um, uh, Sojan is um, bowing down correctly. And the vanquished and the victorious people, the images are very often similar. To the left, we have what is happening, what was happening in 1568. To the right, we see Maharaja Madhu Singhji of Jaipur ruled 1880 to 1922, who has to greet, as the British would say, formally, the Prince of Wales, who later became uh, King George V. And this happened on the 21st November 1905 at 8.30 at the, Royal, at the railway station at Jaipur. So as much as Sojan Singh has to bow down the Maharaja uh, of Jaipur has to bow down towards the colonial ruler, although he is not the real ruler, the actual ruler, uh, Victoria, has never been to India. Then uh, the school of Bundikota is so important because we have a ragamala, uh, a sequence of 36 paintings illustrating so-called musical modes, which is dated to the year 999, that is common area 1591. And this is folio 35, it is not folio 36, it's often, often it's read that this is folio 36, the last folio, but it's not true. I can translate, um, I mean, I read the translation for you, but it says the inscription here on the right half. The book Ragamala has been prepared on Wednesday at noon in the locality of Chunar. The work of the pupils Mir Sayyid Ali, Nadia Gonmul, Kumayun Chahi, and Kwaja Abul Samad, Shirin Kalam. These were the names of the founders of the painting, painters atelier of Akbar, uh, earlier also Humayun, and the slaves Shaikh Hussein, Shaikh Ali, and Shaikh Hatim 
Son of Shaikh Pool Chisti, written on 24th February 1591. Um, have you ever, has ever been anybody to Chuna? Most people haven't. This is the fortress of Chuna on a peninsula um, east of Benares or Kashi and the Ganga River, or as um, one says here, um, the island, the Ganges. And Rao Sojan has built in 1580, this you can read in any book on Benares, um, the so called Bundi Gut. You can still see it here. It was a new palace construction, the Bundi Gut in the 1920s. Here in the early 19th century, the Bundi Gut. And whatever remains of the Bundi Gut is this porch or tower. This is the same you see here. Um, the same you see here. Um, the rest has almost disappeared. And today, this gut is called Bundi Par Kota Gut. Um, here we are back in Bundi in the reign of Rao Oratan, who was um, who followed later Rao Sojan and Rao Boch, then came Rao Ratan, and try to remember these squinch nets, as it's called here, it's an Islamic feature, and the also Rajput architecture. And in the center of these squinch nets, we have a huge portrait of Rao Ratan, I mean, not huge portrait, a darbar of Rao Ratan, and we are inside this part of the palace, which is even painted here. I want to remind you of the fact that this is an old photograph because all the other photographs I see, I've seen in recent years, they are without these towel horses in the shape of elephants and horses. Um, we had dealt with this again, uh, uh, already, I mean, Rao Ratan in Darbar, inspecting a painting presented to him by the spotting artist and uh, try to remember this cheetah or hunting leopard. And um, we have the uh, Nauch girls, which are part of many darbars. They are singing. Um, what is not apparent in this uh, painting is the so-called Chokdal. Now, this is the inside of the oldest building, as much as I can say, within the fort of Kota. This is a building which I have pointed out in the paintings we saw earlier. You have the same squinch nets. Here we would have the painting of Rao Ratan in Darbar. Um, I don't know if it was ever tried to remove the whitewash Maybe they are paintings below the whitewash. I have no idea. Now, this is a darbar given by the Emperor Akbar in 1577. Um, what you see here is the cheetah, the hunting leopard, which we saw earlier in the darbar of Rao Ratan, and uh, darbar on a more simple throne. Uh, composed of this gadi masnat or cushion. Um, then we have here the chokdars, the so-called gate, gatekeepers with their stick. But this gentleman shown also here is not the chokdar. He always has this instrument because he was the head of the army, the senior senior party of uh, Akbar uh, Man Singh of Amir. And uh, here we see um, also uh, Maharaja. This is um, Raja Todamal, lived from 1500 to 1589. And this one here is apparently the Maharaja of Jodhpur. Oh, some people are um, even identified at the right hand border. Why I said this a dari or carpet so important? You see the people on the carpet are there without their shoes or stockings, whereas these people without the carpet like the Bishti and the um, Maharaja here, uh, they are wearing their shoes. Here again, you see the cheetah. And also interesting is that 
Man Singh is the only one who has tied his jama below the right shoulders. You can distinguish the Muslim rulers or attendees of the Daba from the Hindu rulers by the fact by the dress, because the Hindu rulers have their jama or so-called frock coat, as it's called in English, the so-called chakta jama, under their left armpit or shoulder. Another Daba here we have uh, later from one of the followers. This is Shah Jahan receiving Prince Aurangzeb in Darbar, in Aurangzeb, uh, sorry, in, in, in Lahore, apparently on the 22nd March, 1642, in the Divan-i-Am of Lahore. Interesting again are the Choptas here with their sticks, but if you look more properly, also he has a masnat in his back. If you look more properly, we have people with their jamas tied under the left shoulder. They are not identified in this painting. Sometimes there's a nashtalic inscription here on this um, ribbon. But I think the one to, on the left is Maharaja Jaswan Singh Rator, who ruled between 1638 and 1678. And the one behind him, this gentleman, is probably Maharaja Jai Singh of Amber, not to be confounded with the Jai Singh who later founded Jaipur. He is also called Mirza Raja Jai Singh, and he ruled from 1621 to 1667. Also interesting is that in many of these paintings belonging to the so-called um, Shah Jahan Nama, um, they appear on his left side. Now we are making a long leap to Delhi from Lahore. This is a view of the so-called proclamation Darbar. Darbar is now my word or a modern word in Delhi. And here we see the full view. This Daba proclaimed um, Queen Victoria, who ruled, as you know, from 1837 to 1901. She was complained as Empress of India by the colonial power. And the word Darba for this meeting was not yet used. It was always called Imperial Assembly or Imperial Assemblage. Now here we have a painting by Valentine Cameron Princip, who traveled through India in order to paint the major darbaris or members of this darbar. And uh, it's a huge painting, as you can see, it measures more than three meters in width, and it's now in Windsor in the Royal Collection. Seated here is the then Viceroy, um, 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 Lord Lytton, and uh, please try to see or try to understand this. This is shown like a small chamber, but these Maharajas with their British uh, regions, they are seated in fact far away from the dais where is the throne of Lord Lytton. And here a uh, princip tried to um, paint a kawasi or servant with a, um, a chauri and here with a mortal, but he apparently has never seen this properly. This is how far away where the Indian rulers, when it came to the imperial assemblage of 1877. We will see the following here, which um, goes on there. Uh, interesting are these large banners. And um, I saw you just one more. Um, it's almost a full circle and we return to the painting by um, um, Cam uh, um, sorry, Princip. Um, this is Edward Robert Lytton, Balba Lytton, first Earl of Lytton, the Viceroy between 1876 to 1880, seated here, dressed like um, the Roi Soleil. And um, here you see more closely all these banners. 
And if you believe it or not, one of these banners has survived to this day in Kota. But before we turn to Kota, we go to Bundi. There's a book in which all these schemes for these banners have survived. This is the so-called Bowring album in the in the office library. I mean, in those days at Blackfriars Road today in the British Library. And um, as you can see, it's totally European. Almost nothing is Indian, with the exception of this dagger, probably a katar or push dagger. And this inscription, which reads Sri Rangesh Bhakta Bundish Ram Singh. Um, the motto is Sri Rangesh Bhakta is not complete. Um, this um, explanation is half in, uh, in, in major part in English and most uh, the important parts are of course all in Latin, but this should not uh, matter now. Um, who was Rangesh? This was then a deity which was considered almost as a tutelar deity of, of Undi, which was introduced by um, this gentleman, Maharao uh, Raja Umit Singhji, called Sriji. Um, this is the oldest photograph, which was taken in the early 1860s, which shows us this very Ram Singh, which is mentioned in this inscription. It's an old photograph. I will show you a better um, copy. This is Maharao Ram Singhji in the center to his right, his son, Raghubir Singhji, but he has shaken, he has moved his head, so one cannot see it properly. And this gentleman, this Kavasi looks very strange because he has also moved his head. Um, this insignia is very important. It's a chatra or umbrella, or, or, or rather sun parasol. And this is the Chamara or Chanbar. And here is the mortar, perhaps not, perhaps even still made of real peacock feathers. Now, this is the very object in the uh, Kota Museum. And um, it is, uh, it has a small label. Uh, I, I will read you what's written on the label. Banner presented by Lord Lytton in 1877 on behalf of Queen Victoria on her becoming Empress of India. And there is a motto, and the motto is this, but it's put in here and on this ribbon. It says, Agnir Api Tej Se, which is translated by the power of fire and water. And this is what you see um, a number of times if we have the times to do so. Now see this gentleman, emerging from flames, holding a sword and a bow. Uh, this alone would uh, not be the product of an Indian artist because an Indian artist would never pair the bow with the sword. He would pair the bow with the arrows or the sword with the shield, but not like this. And these men issuing from the flames, we have on the banner of Bundi and on the banner of Kota. The thing is that there is a real historic background. The clan to which both the Bundi and Kota rulers belong form a sub-clan sub of the so-called Chauhans. And the Chauhans belong to the so-called uh, fire clans or Agnivangshis. Um, they, they came out from a fire and here you see the Indian artist from Bundi has paired the sword correctly with a shield. And this is the very place from where the ancestors of all these rulers emerged. This is how it looks today or, or 20 years ago. And this is the very fire pit. And it says here, this is uh, Maharishi Vashishta's um, a very early historical Agni Kund or Fire Lake, the Agni Vangshas, the Rajputs, which are the Paramas, the Chohans, etc., etc. So, also, this is shown as the emergence of the Haras. Now, 
the Garuda, which is in the center of this, he never flies straight up to the stars as is shown on the banner. He flies more horizontally as shown on this banner from a Kota uh, painting. And we see the banner here um, unfurled on the so-called Hati Nishan or the banner elephant, which has the royal banner as it was photographed um, when Mary Leiter and uh, the then Viceroy of India visited Kota in the year 1902. This is an original drawing which shows the size, um, it's, it's a huge thing, from which is a drawing from which all other Garudas for the banner were copied. The Garuda holds the Shankar or conch and the gada or mace, because this garuda is a vehicle of the Lord or Vahana of Lord Vishnu. Now here are the same banners, the same Nishan with the garuda, you cannot see it properly, being worshipped by the Maharao of Kota um, in connection with the so-called Shastra Puja or the veneration of weapons. And this takes place within the Raj Mahal. Um, not only are these worshipped in the Raj Mahal, there is a certain Nishan Puja, that means um, in front of the Chutala deity of the Kota state, you see here, this is Sri Bhutchnathji, and here we see Maharao Bhutchwaj Singhji. Here are the two standards the two Nishans with the Kota Garuda. That was the emblem of the Kota state since 1719. And today, this half British, half Rajasthani emblem um, can be seen above the license plate of the royal jeep. And not only there. This is the oldest photograph I came across, also taken in the early 1860s, apparently by um, Zatabak Impe again, showing the Maharao, as it's written here, the Maharao of Kota and his son, Chatrushal, that means Maharao Raja Ram Singhji, etc. We see him here again, and we'll have another opportunity to watch this photograph more closely. Well, Kota is, of course, not the only state where, uh, or um, Deek, Bharatpur that we have seen before, where Darbas took place. This is a photograph taken at Udaipur on the 8th February, 1887, on the occasion of the um, Queen Victoria's Jubilee. And uh, it's, of course, a French description here. It says Durbar, to me, that is et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this photo shows suddenly on the right hand side, because normally they were on the left hand side, are all sorts of British people. And they are all by now, when the photographs are taken, seated on chairs. And the early Daba, nobody is ever seated on a chair, maybe with one exception. And also another thing which the Britishers and sorry, the colonial power introduced was that many of them may keep their boots on. This was impossible in the early 19th century. And even Maharaj, Maharana Fatih Singhji wears boots, as we shall see on the next slide. Um, it shows Maharao Fatih Singhji, who ruled from 1884 to 19. Um, 1930. Um, what is so interesting is that his throne, this is this piece of furniture, rests on, I mean, the legs of this throne are lions. Well, this is not the first lion throne in India because in Sanskrit, the word for throne is Sinhasana, the lion's seed. Here on the left, we have a life-size portrait of the um, 
the father of the famous ruler Kanishka, the ruler Vima Katfises, or as in English as it's pronounced, Vima Katfises, who ruled from 1813 to 1827 on the throne and his throne already in the second beginning of second century has these lions. And he is seated also, Kushan said this, he came from the north with his boots on and pending legs. And uh, Maharana Ji also has his European, wearing his European shoes. Normally, the Maharana, when he is in his, let's so say, local Darbar, he sits on the Gadi or Maznat, as we have seen before, with these cushion behind. Here are the mortal bearers, just two insignia holders. Um, here we go to another place. We are here now at Alva. Um, uh, I met the sister of uh, latest Highness Boni there several times. This is the ruler of Alva, the young um, um, Sri Sabai Sheodan Singh Ji Bahadur Maharao Raja of Alva, who ruled from 1857 to 1874. And the photograph was again taken by Captain Eugene Clutterbuck Impe of the Bengal Staff Corps. Here very nicely, you can see the Rajkadi with side pillows, which are at times called takiya. And the insignia bearers, we have here the Chanwal, the Morchal, the Morchal, and the Chanwal or Chauri. And then we have here one of the so-called Chopdans. Uh, one of these persons can be properly identified. I tried to highlight it in red, but it's, uh, as I see now, hardly visible. Um, this is Takur Lakdir Singhji, a Rajput chieftain of Alva, as he was identified. So <clears> he <throat> is in somewhat dim light, and uh, here you see him much better. Um, now the cushion as such, that's quite flexible. This is a painting in the collection of the uh, Baradevtaji of Kota, and that it cannot roll away, that uh, is prevented by this type of um, device, a kind of scaffolding. Uh, so this is why uh, you can lean against it without uh, fearing to fall down. This is a kind of Rajgadi on display in the Paramahal of um, Kota. And now we come to the Kota Darbar. Uh, you have heard everything about the origin of this. You will see the quota standards to the left and the right. And this is the Rajgadi, where the then most important person, which in those days was uh, Bhanwarji Ijarat Singhji, will take place. We have the 18th of January, 1989. And this is how this so-called Darba Hall, or Darba Mahal, looked like in 1902. The Banwalji, today Maharaji, will sit here. Where are the, these two chairs? And above these two chairs, we have, well, the next slide will show it more clearly. We have um well the um george v and um his wife alexandra of denmark uh, and, and, and sorry sorry uh, this is um she was the queen the queen consort of edward the seventh this is of course then uh, um, queen consort edward seven and um, we are back in 1989. Here is a Chopdal, so this tradition is still kept. And this is how the Chopdal looked at the court of Shah Jahan. 
And this is the object here on display in the Meranga Fort Museum, Jodhpur. And here are two different, uh, two different Choktas, one from Kota and one from Gvalior in a painting that we shall see very soon. Now then sudden, then entered, we were all seated and we all got up, entered present, the, the then Maharaji of Kota. Um, and um, we had uh, Maharao, uh, sorry, Banba Ijarat Singhji. And why I'm showing this detail to your left is the fact that here we have a very special sal page. You can see here and see here. And the one to the left shows Maharao Umit Singhji, second of Kota. He ruled from 1889 to 1940. This, of course, is the Singhji, second, the then Maharao. And we can go further back. Um, even uh, the Maharaj Kumar Bhim Singhji, as he was then called, the later Shatpushal, aged about 25. He ruled from 1866 to 1889. He is wearing a very, very similar South page, as we have seen with uh, the then Bhanbanji Icharat Singhji, who is the Bhanba? The Bhanba is the son of the Maharaj Kumar, and the Maharaj Kumar is the son of the Maharao. We have seen him before, Maharao Ram Singhji, and uh, somebody from Gwalior, which you can see the shape of the turban. Here are the Chopdars. Here are the leaders of the protocol. And uh, here are this type of ceremonial gifts. And there we will see a detail. This is a sharp peach. This object, jewelry of jewelry, which is tied to the turban or pagli. And uh, you can still see such things in Jaipur, in the art trade, and the Mirza Ismail wrote, I um, will not say more, everybody knows where it is. Then after His Highness Maharabim Singh Ji II has entered the Darbar room, um, he may, he is, we will be seated, the Banraji is seated, and all other people may sit down with the exception of the bearers of the insignias, the so-called Kavasis, and the Chokdams. Here we have the insignia as we have seen it on the uh, chart, the white Chamar, or, or sorry, Chanbar, Chanbar, Dal, and the Talva, and here seated on the Rajgadi is the then Banbanji. Um, they are not just any servants, they are royal servants, and they are uh, also mostly identified in uh, paintings. For instance, if you have a look at this shield, um, you also see the coat of arms of the Kota state, the origin of which uh, was explained. Now, even more interesting was the fact that Banvaji Ichirat Singhji didn't lean against this huge cushion with the side pillows, and also the fact that to his right there is one line of the Maharao, the Maharaj Kumar, his father, late His Highness, and the Banvaji himself. And another thing which is very important for the first time. We have ladies to his proper left. Um, this I show you because you can see here, it's the extreme left and the extreme right, the Kota standards, the uh, Kota Nishan with the Garuda. Um, we have here some people which uh, we'll see later, and they are also Western. Um, visitors like the 
ambassador of Italy, the ambassador of the Federal Republic of uh, Germany, a collector of German from of, of paintings from Germany. And this is uh, Carrie Welsh, who I hope needs no introduction. And here we have the standing Chobdana. Then enters, because it's a so-called Tika ceremony or Tika Darba, and could also call it engagement Darba, enters the father of the bride. Um, um, he was, I know how he was called, but he wouldn't like to be called like this. Um, where is His Highness from Suket? Well, the, uh, the Mahar, not the Maharaja, but the Maharaj from Suket and his son. Uh, that means the brother of the bride enters this Daba hall and then they were also allowed to sit. And um, uh, these came from Suket, that means from Himachal Pradesh. Um, now here, three, uh, the three other important members of these Darbar, that's um, Maharao, um, ah, okay. Sri Rameshwar Singh of Suket and his son Jai Singh. And the other important people are here. We we'll start with him in the center, Maharao Bhim Singh II of Bhim Singh Ji II of Kota, who ruled from 1940 to 1991. Um, the father of Maharaj Kumar. Which Raj Singhji of Kota, who, who, who was a tutelar ruler from um, 1991 to earlier this year. And then, which is of course important, Maharao Raja Ranjit Singhji of Bundi, who was a tutelar ruler of Bundi from 1977 to 2010. Um, I owe a lot of gratitude to all three of them, and particularly to Maharao Bhim Singh Ji II. He really smiled, but uh, he, he was so happy to greet present His Highness Maharaj, Maharaja of Jodhpur Gaj Singh Ji during the ceremony of the wedding of um, the then Banwaji of Kota Ijaraj Singh Ji, and here is his father, and Everybody smiles when both these rulers meet. I owe a lot of gratitude to him because he introduced me to Devta Sridharlal, who presides over the um, a, a very large Haveli with endlessly wall paintings, uh, the Devta Jiki, Bada Devta Jiki Haveli in Kota, um, without his. Uh, introduction, I would not have got the permission to take photographs. And then, well, he doesn't look like the Maharao Raja of Bundi, but this is Ranjit Singh Ji when I visited him at his home um, in the Moti Mahal at Bundi. Um, then I owe an extremely large gratitude to latest Highness Bridgewat Singh Ji. Um, a great gentleman whom we see here at the reception um, which precedes the Ravana Bad or the slaying of Ravana uh, as part of the Dashara or English Dasera uh, celebrations. Um, now the left half of the Darba, um, um, uh, Mimi, you should interrupt me if I am uh, using too much time for this presentation. Um, you have, when you I, have I, time. You have more I have time. time. I have some more time. Okay, on the left, on the left hand, you see women, which you, you didn't see before, but these women were of a special higher rank. I mean, here is the, uh, on the extreme right, the wife of the German ambassador, the wife of the Italian ambassador, 
and uh, then of course we have the sister of present his highness and uh, the uh, mother and um, Rashmata and somebody you now probably oh, this is the sister um, this is Gayatri Devi um, of Jaipur the third wife of the then Maharaja of Jaipur and he wrote this book A Princess Remembers published in 1977. So more women, and as I said, I repeat myself, um, the, the, previously there was no recorded daba, at least not in photographs or paintings, where women took place. But here they are in an upper gallery and um, they can look down from the, this part of the Umed Bhavan. Uh, here we have another Darbar or Darihana, as the people in Kota would say, um, in connection with the marriage of uh, uh, Marwari princess. Um, we won't have time to deal with that. But now, woman downstairs on the floor, uh, just the um, uh, uh, part of the bride, and the women are looking there from galleries, from the balconies, and um, uh, they are, well, as you can see here. Now returning to Kota, um, a good view of the Raj Gadi, um, then Bhanwarji, Icharaj Singhji. Uh, there are many ceremonies which partly are explained for those who are interested. There is a book which was written by um, um, late His Highness Kota and a German collector, which is called Festivals and Ceremony of Kota. And there you will see many more photographs. That means the giving of the silver coconut, etc., etc., for this negotiation regarding the marriage and the future. As I said, Darikhana can mean carpet house, because once you leave the carpet, you can put on your shoes again. And there's a Kavasi who has just waited for this moment. Everybody had to look for the shoes a long time, but when Late His Highness left the uh, Daba Hall, he had his shoes at his feet immediately, no time. Um, there was time for a photo shooting, you see from left to right, uh, Late His Highness um, Kota, Late His Highness Bundi, Present His Highness uh, Kota, uh, Late Late His Highness um, uh, uh, Kota Bhim Singh II, and then the uh, Mahat Kumar from uh, Suket and his uh, son uh, Jaidev, who, by the way, is also, uh, meanwhile, also married, if I remember well, to a lady from the royal house of Jodhpur. Um, not, was this okay? Um, as you could see from the painting, from the large wall painting showing the Darba of Rao Ratan. And uh, I can show you more paintings where this happened. Part of a Darba was the presentation or the uh, ceremony like looking at miniature paintings. In these two boxes, and the last time it seems they were opened on 18th of March in 1987, um, now we are a few years later. Um, there are some of the paintings in the collection of um, the Maharaji of Kota. Here we have, um, maybe I can explain you this um, because um, some people should be interested uh, why they are only Westerners and who they are. This gentleman here to our left seated on a chair, he is something special. He was known as um, Sri Würfel or Alfred Würfel, who already um, in the uh, 1930s lived in Delhi. But when World War II broke out, he was put to a camp, a prisoner of war camp in Dehradun. And there was one at least in the German speaking countries, famous inmate, the Austrian mountaineer Heinrich Harrer. He was in the same camp as Heinrich Harrer, but he did not escape. Heinrich Harrer escaped 
in the direction of Tibet and became a friend of the 14th Dalai Lama. Um, maybe some of you know the, his book, Seven Years in Tibet. Um, the gentleman here is um, Dr. Konrad Seitz, the then ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany, his wife, Eva Seitz, um, Horst Metzger, who has written this book on the festivals of Kota in conjunction with Maharao Butchwaj Singhji. And here we have Kerry Welch with his wife, the late Kerry Welch with his wife, Edith, pointing at this um, large Kota painting, which shows, we are coming towards an end, which shows the Maharao of Kota about to do a certain ceremony that means striking the Torana or the Torana Mana facing the Maharaval of Jaisalmer, Gach Singhji. We have seen him before uh, when there was a negotiating Darbar. And this is a ceremony which um, all the Rajput clans, as much I can uh, tell as an eyewitness, uh, are doing today. He has a kind of a whip, normally it's used with a sword. He has a kabasi in the back with a big uh, the ch uh, the chowdi, and here is a mochal, and here carried is the chatra. And uh, uh, this object is actually not part of a darbar, but part of a savari or procession. And here is the skate, and after he has touched it, it's uh, lifted up and he may enter. And um, this is another occasion. Um, the first occasion uh, was at Jaisalmer. This here is at Odaipur. And uh, again, we see this Torana and it's suspended from these two strings. Um, this is how it looks today. This is Raghwendra Singh Rathor striking the Torana in Jodhpur on the 5th February 2001. And uh, then he is, it's another ceremony, it's a welcome ceremony also under this Torana, Raghwendra Singh Rathor and his wife Kavita Singh Rathor on 17th April 1701. And the last photograph is Maharao Ram Singh. To the left and to the right, you can really see it's done with a sword. This is Archie become Aditya Singh Palaita striking the Torana on 26 February 2000, also in Jodhpur. And uh, here we are at the end. I thank you for your attention. Oh, um, <laughs> this, would lead, this would lead to another uh, story which I won't tell. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joachim. Let me just see um, whether I can see you or not. Hold on, can you stop screen sharing now? Yeah, uh, very good. All right, I hope you're able to see me. Um, thank you very much. This was a lot of information and I'm particularly grateful that you talked about the etymology, um, also really what was happening at the Durba, uh, that you also talked about the insignia and um, how this was then continued um, during the um, um, during the time of the of the Raj and so on. So it was a lot, a lot of detail. Before I come to the question, by Mark Brandt, and I'd like to just comment briefly um, because this class, as I said, is experimental in nature. Um, in, in the whole semester, we are focusing on a number of room typologies. And um, one of the issues we are looking at is the question of cultural influence, um, particularly when it comes to Mughals and Rajputs. And you know, one of the things we are kind of you know, commenting on or thinking about is not so much um, the issue of imitation, but really influence going in both directions and interwoven cultural elements. Um, in a number of studies we see, especially when it comes to, let's say, Rashtra Pati Bhavan or um, monuments built by, by the British, um, it's 
often overly politicized, um, arguing that um, these elements are imitated by um, from the Mughals in line with the Mughal tradition, whereas this is quite different from what we have found, um, that there was not so, such a straightforward kind of influence, but indeed the whole concept of the Durbar Hall was actually not from the Mughals, but existed, of course, you know, already in the Hindu tradition. We are also talking about the Jaroka. You didn't specifically mention the, the Jaroka in your talk. Um, but this seemed to be um, a kind of precursor also of the um, of the Durbar. And of course, the issue of the interior and the exterior, which is often very fluid in the Indian tradition, but certainly the Durbar Hall as a room typology was a continuation of this um, for practical reasons also, you know, from tents and being outside looking up to the uh, balcony, the Jaroka, um, leading it into a room which was also influenced by Persia, um, this kind of uh, room typology. Maybe you can comment on this because before we go to a Mark Brand's um, question. Uh, well, thanks for your uh, comments. The point is, um, I had, I mean, we have seen more than 100, um, 100 more than 111 slides. And uh, I had a section on the Jaroka um, in which I tried to show that the Jaroka existed also or already in pre Mughal times. This one can see from the architecture, for instance, from the palace of Raja Man Singh in Gwalior and many other Rajput palaces where, which I had uh, occasion to see, but which I didn't introduce. Um, um, who is interested? I had uh, published an article which is uh, uh, available on Academia about the um, British ruler who became the successor of the Mughals because he addressed the public um, at a Jaroka in Delhi in uh, 1911, that was the 1911 Darbar. And also um, I'm afraid there are many more Mughal influences, which um, I just briefly mentioned when referring to the Sarpej, because this turban ornament, um, the Mughals initiated a tradition under Shah Jahan which is still alive today. That is the tradition of wearing the ruler as a portrait in the pagri or turban. I have uh, selected quite a few examples because this tradition is still going on in Jodhpur, in Udaipur and other places, but time was too short. Um, and what you said about the Mughal architect architecture compared to the Rajput architecture, uh, Professor Petro Cioli, who had given uh, one extremely good uh, webinar on this topic, yeah. he once said, well, uh, uh, there with the Mughals, we have the tent and it's, it's all straightforward and we have this and this. With the Rajput, it's more difficult. I think it has to do with their temples. And that's what it is. Um, I had this in mind because I had um, the charts of, or said ground plans of the Garl of Kota, of the palace of Kota, and um, how the palaces were arranged around the old temples, like the temple of the ancient Kul Devda. I mean, the, the, the ancient Kul Devi. Ashapura Deviji, which is still uh, venerated today as part of the Dashara Puja, and not only part of the Dashara Puja, on uh, during the birthday celebrations of His Highness, uh, His Highness go has to go to offer something to uh, Ashapura Devi, and I wanted to show you that uh, a marriage procession has to go away, which is far away from a straight line, because one first has to offer something to these tutelar deity, that means the ancient clan, the clan deity Ashapura Devi, and then the clan deity ever since 1719, Sri Brishnatji. And in later days, even done Sri Brishwatji, which is a 
different um, DET. So um, I'm sorry that um, I, I, I can make a continuation. I can <laughs> offer that if you're interested. And within that presentation, I could deal with all these topics which you just mentioned. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mark Grant, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question or shall I just read it out because you should be able to unmute yourself if you would like to. I'm, I'm happy to ask it if yes. you can hear me. Really? Yes, can you yes. Hear yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you. Can you turn on the light? Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much for the for the talk, uh, which I very much enjoyed. Um, I, I think my, my question was partly answered part way through the talk, yeah. so I'll refine the question slightly. So, so looking at, at Indian throne audience, throne hall, Darba scenes before the colonial, before the British period, there doesn't appear to be much use of thrones. And by throne, I suppose I mean a four-legged, probably wooden-framed, type of chair or settle with things on top. The, the only notable exceptions I can think of in Indian, especially Indian Islamicite paintings of the early modern period are very Persianate or Persian styled examples where there's a Persian tact with hexagonal or octagonal forms. Otherwise, it, it seems to be that um hello it seems to be that one tends to see people sitting on a rug with their back to a stage like your initial image or uh, on a rug with a bolster to one side if they're in a, a wider dar bar in a sort of relatively external public hall or more more occasionally on some kind of framed bed or bo large bolster cushion with an awning over them and so um I'm just wondering why there wasn't more made of woodwork or joinery or the actual structure of what in Western convention we might think of as a throne chair. Um, Can I answer yeah, this? Yeah. Um, yes, well, 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 thanks for the remark. Uh, your observation is uh, absolutely correct. Um, I also had prepared uh, three, four slides on this topic. Um, because we have scenes with thrones in Indian painting, in Jain paintings, uh, much prior to the event of the Mughals, we are talking about the 15th century and earlier, where thrones were shown. But uh, these thrones mostly would introduce so-called shahis or kings coming from the West. And they were seated on a throne, as you said, with a backrest, with four legs, and you know, um, but without the paraphernalia around, because the paintings were only as, as small as a cigarette box, or even smaller. Um, um, in the Kota paintings, we do have paintings which show a kind of exception. Um, and I also had to leave this out because uh, we have these also in uh, Jodhpur and also in Udaipur, thrones on four legs, where the legs are not necessarily made of full-fledged lion figures, but just the lion paws. Because the lion throne with the lion paws is an invention of the people in Egypt, I don't know which dynasty, but some 4,000 years ago, when we had such thrones without the formal depiction of a lion, but just with the paws of the lion, the, you know, the, the, the chairs, the, the, the legs of the throne, um, uh, this is very old. But in India, um, it was not very fashionable. For this reason, I had shown the throne of Bimakatphysis or Bimakatphysis from the um, first half of the second century, where we have um, all what you mentioned, I mean, four legs made of uh, uh, showing the lions. Um, um, but this was not very fashionable in India. There are portraits um, of Jahangir, of the emperor Jahangir, 
where he is seated on such a throne with the four lions as legs. Um, um, I haven't shown this because I, I could have shown many Mughal Darbar uh, uh, paintings uh, with lots of details. Um, but um, for the Rajasthani Darbars, um, this was not a hype. This was not really um, the aim of having such a throne. Um, um, until uh, when was the Ajmer Darbar? This was in, I think, in 1832. And um, there the British already insisted on shares for a very simple reason. In former times, prior to 1832, the British were not allowed to sit in Darbar on the dari, on the carpet. So this was good because they didn't have to put their boots off, but they had to sit on the ground without chairs, without kursi, so without chairs. So when they were sitting on the ground with their boots on, they had these spores on for the horses. And this was not very comfortable to sit with the boots and with the spores with, uh, you know, folded legs on the ground. So the British insisted on chairs. Um, the, the, earlier, uh, the earlier paintings show the British seated on the ground, but only later when the British power was becoming more and more important after the treaties that uh, Colonel James, uh, Captain James Todd made, uh, more and more chairs were introduced. And the word the chair, kursi, was so unknown that in some Darbara paintings, next to the chair, the word kursi is written in Nagari script because it was a piece of furniture which was until then almost unknown in India. And something else was unknown in India. And this also had to be uh, marked by a special inscription. The word maze or mage, table, you never see a table. <laughs> Everything was done on the carpet, on the ground. So for this reason, why in India this worked for thousands of years? Why should they suddenly use tables or chairs? Um, they were happy without. And um, somehow they, they knew, of course, the Mughal thrones, which were you know, more bombastic, um, but they didn't copy there to this extent. Never. If I can just add something. So basically, um, your question is also re relating to a kind of temporal element, right? So later, um, not only because the British insisted, but simply because there was more cultural exchange. Not everything was, uh, you know, it was very common that you then find in the 19th century a separate dining room for foreigners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Or if you think of the Begum Samru um, example, uh, for instance, you know, um, she herself she she wanted uh, chairs and so on, and, and and vice versa. You can also find examples where the British, when they receive visitors from India also try to uh, accommodate them. But there's, for instance, one example of the British residency in Delhi in the 19th century, early 19th century, where they had a peacock throne made for the Mughal emperor to visit uh, the residency and so on. You have that. And then I wanted to just mention one thing that you also have similarities between um, India and Europe. And I'm talking about the 17th century, for example, the whole idea of the ruler is sitting but others are not allowed to sit because of respect and so on. You have that, of course, in Europe as well. You have that, you know, with Louis XIV and so on. And even in fact, chairs were not come, stools were coming, benches were coming, but chairs came much, much later in Europe too. So this is a similar development and evolution. You still have that in the name of chairman to chair a meeting, board and so on. All of these things accentuate this kind of hierarchy and authority associated with these pieces of furniture. So this is, this is very similar. Well, I, I yes, must make a small uh, sort of amendment. Um, it was only in the Mughal Darbars that the so-called Darbaris had to stand and were not allowed to sit. In all the Rajput or Rajasthani Darbars, everybody could sit down with the exception of the Chopdars and the, um, 
the Kavasi selves bearing, uh, carrying the insignia. Uh, everybody could sit down in a Rajput Darbar, but not in a Mughal Darbar. They're very interesting students. Do you have some questions? Especially since we've um, covered this topic. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Speak up, speak up. So, do you want to come here so that the Professor Bautzer can see you? Yeah. And the others. Uh, oh, professor, I wanted to ask uh, how, like the interior, like we talked, uh, we talk about interiors in this class. So whatever, like the pictures you showed us from the olden times, like the miniature paintings, they had a very uh, grandeur sort of looking, uh, like the Rajputana culture and everything. But the uh, whatever the earlier pictures that you showed us like the recent ones they were very simple very basic like the only decoration they had was a little bit of carpet and nothing sort of uh grandeur like the rajputs had before so like uh what do you think was the transition of all of that um you you want to say that the earlier paint that the earlier paintings would show less less sort of say luxury items or uh, did I understand, and, and, and not the later ones, or vice versa? Uh, I'm saying that the earlier paintings were more of a grandeur, and then the recent ones are not like that. So, like, uh, it sort of diminishes the royalty that the Rajput show. So, like, uh, uh, I, 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 I see what you mean. Um, well, you <laughs> have in the early period, um, the painters had lots of time to finish a uh, a painting or a sequence of painting like a Ragamala, Badamasa, Garasikapia, or whatever. But in the later days, um, the artists had to be something like a journalist, like an official photographer. And whatever the ruler did had to be painted. And um, um, I also didn't show this in some darabars, you see painters working. And we have even, um, even from, from, from German princes who went, to, who went to India in the 1830s, we have descriptions of darabars in Himachal Pradesh and uh, where they said something, oh, I saw th there is a man who was painting. He, he, he took my my likeness. He was painted me. And then he went to this gentleman, and he said, oh, um, he just painted the feather on my head. Because this was for the iconography. There were certain elements for iconography, which today we cannot read any longer to that extent. But it was in such a way that, um, and I also didn't show you the drawings of Darbars, which are also very interesting. I didn't show you the Bhaktans or Nachinis of Darbars. I didn't show you the Jetis or Vrestlers of Darbars. All this is wonderfully documented. But you see, we, we are talking already since one and a half hours. And um, I, I can show this all to you. Um, and then I hope you would understand that the power of the Rajputs is not shown in a diminished form in later paintings. It's, um, there are more and more elements who are cultural input, as uh, Professor Schmidt has uh, mentioned, and maybe they are less ancient elements. This is possible. And uh, as we have seen, there are so many Western elements like these dragons at the coat of arms of Kota and all that, which never existed before, because the the Nishan of Kota before was just the flying Garuda on the, uh, um, um, on, the on the on the flag on air yeah, on the Nishan. So um, I could show that if um, if you asked Madame to. <laughs> Ask me another time to, to do it. 
<laughs> I think we need a part two. With this, uh, we should stop because otherwise my head will be cut off <laughs> for um, taking this room for too long. Um, thank you very, very much um, for this wonderful talk and really, uh, I mean, illustrations with such details and taking um, the objects also associated with the Durba from so many different areas. That was really, really fascinating. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.